Yeah. 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 Ye
Okay. How would I get to the file that I dragged on? It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's just represented by the extension. So you can actually just rename a file and Great. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to rename that document, and you'll see that by changing the file extension, it changes the way it holds the data. So I'll be renaming it to a zip file extension. Okay, so as you can see, it at least changed it. Oh, okay. Okay, well, as you can see, uh, it is now a zip file just by changing the extension um, in the name. So the extension basically just is the way of how it holds the data. Okay. I will fix that in a moment. All right, going on to hex editor. So at the beginning, um, I mentioned, yes, that's okay. We're streaming. We're good. Okay. Okay. Um, so the hex editor is what we mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, and you can basically corrupt a file by messing with the hex or in the header, which a lot of CTS will do. And by getting the, in order to get the flag, you would need to fix that uh, header data. And uh, hex headers can be used to view binary files. And if you aren't normally able to open it up in a notepad, um, sometimes with CTS, you can open them up in a notepad and just control find for the flag, which we'll work on a bit later. Or you can open up in the hex file, and sometimes you can search through and find the flag in there. All right, and then there are some other GUIs for Mac OS and Linux that you can use if you have that type of computer. So uh, feel free to download those if you would like. All right, strings. So sometimes strings are hidden in the picture or file that you have for CTS. And uh, there is a reason why a string would be better to hide than a full picture hidden in the file. And that's because uh, the strings are ASCII um, and you can manipulate the binary a bit easily, easier through the string. And also, for example, if a malware creates a file, the file name is stored as a string in the binary. So disk images hold a snapshot of the hard drive at a point of containing all the files that are on the disk at a time. There are different types of file systems depending on the machine you use. NTFS is the file system used on newer Windows machines. And if you have a USB of some sort of removable device, chances are that USB uses a fat file system because 
most other machines are able to also read from it. And macOS uses its own file system. Um, older ones use HSF and newer ones use APFS. And file signatures, like I mentioned, uh, these are just some examples of different signatures that would be associated with the file extension, especially if you open it up in a hex editor. Uh, so PKs, CRUZIP files, PNG, et cetera, and you can access the whole list um, through the slideshow. Okay. So what is file carving? So I'm gonna just throw this one out there and see if anyone has a guess on what this could be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, just taking part of the file out. Um, so the original definition of file carving is taking a disk image and directly carving out files from the disk image, usually when mounting them or taking files off that don't work from that. Mm -hmm. And this can be used when investigating criminal defense and uh, are the files really deleted from the machine or is there any residuals left? And that's something that file carving can do. So for example, on Linux, you shouldn't be able to mount most of these types of file systems using the mount command. Uh, you do this by passing the path of the disk file image and then a path to an empty directory that you want to mount to the disk image onto. And this will effectively replace whatever was inside that directory with root contents of the disk. And you might need to use sudo to do that. And let's see. And file carving is, uh, sometimes people get that confused with file recovery um, because essentially you're recovering part of an image, but it's different than file recovery. So how are they different? Well, file recovery techniques make use of a file system um, information, and by using this information, many files can be recovered. If the information is not correct, then it will not work. And on the other hand, the file carving works only on raw data on the media, and it's not connected with the file system structure. File carving doesn't care about any file systems, which is used for storing files um, in the FAS file system, as mentioned earlier, or things like that. And the first character of the file name is replaced with a marker, but the file data itself is left unchanged and until it's overwritten, the data is still present. So the overall idea of file carving is that you can actually search files uh, through signatures. And so as you can see here, file carving um, you can take out the top secret information. Okay, and some forensic tools, uh, you can use hex editor, uh, which you can open an uh, image directly into hex editor and you can view the hex that way. Uh, binwalk, uh, you often use binwalk uh, with the flag E to extract information from a picture. And then also installing 7-Zip is very useful. Um, it was interesting because I was in the CTF competition, uh, the Lisa CTF, and I was the only person that had 7-Zip downloaded at my table. And so I was able to solve a CTF like in under 10 seconds and everyone else was struggling, like not knowing what to do. And it was just because it automatically opened in 7-Zip. Okay. Uh, uh, so now we're going to go over to Pico CTF. So go ahead and log into that um, while I switch screens. And then any questions as well while I'm switching screens. Are there any questions in the Discord chat or anything. While we're switching, I think there was some. Well, did, when they do the slides, have the Q and A thing? Yeah. Basically, it's been like I remember it's 
it's a very cool feature. But Does anyone need more time signing in, if you're signing in? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it'll only let me share my home screen, so I guess I'll just switch, I mean, to people can this one. Yeah. Yeah, when I do the display, it's a wash. Yeah. That only gives me this choice. Yeah. So I'll have to keep one thing. Yeah. But that's fine, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for your patience. Okay, so if you're following along, you're gonna go ahead and click on forensics and that will pull up uh, CTFs starting with the easiest one. So we're gonna work on this first one. So this first one pulls up a very cute cat and uh, looking at this, what are some of the first things you would think about doing in order to find the flag for this? Yeah, look at strings. Okay, so let's pull the metadata. So, yeah. Opening up as a text file, yeah, that's a good one. I, I generally do that. Um, okay, so we can control find for Pico CTF. Okay, so unfortunately, this one won't give it away through opening up as a text file. Okay, uh, so another way you could do uh, that is you can copy the link address and that we get. Okay, and then, so we're going to look at the metadata. So we're gonna use the EXIF tool on the cat. Uh, okay, so looking at this meta, uh, metadata, is there anything interesting or it stands out to anyone? Which one? Oh, okay. Oh, how do you, you mean change the color? Okay. Like blue? How do you? Okay. 
broken. Oh. Okay. okay, is that better? All right, so what looks unique or what? Yeah, that might. Okay. All right. So, looking at licenses, that kind of looks like a little unique, and maybe that could be a flag there. So, we're going to. Okay. So, you would just copy that or anything that looks suspicious. Uh, Would echo it and see if you can decrypt it, maybe like base 64. All right. So, yeah, that was the flag. Yay. All right. And then let's see if that was correct. Hooray. All right, going on to the next one. Uh, so I believe it's pronounced met Matro Chica. Chica. Yeah, so those are the cool dolls that have dolls on the inside. Um, so we're going to go ahead and work on this one. Okay, so we're going to open up the file. All right, so what are some ideas on how to go about this one? Um, keep in mind that CTS is just what you know, what happens in the Yeah, let's see what type of metadata we can extract. Yeah, okay. Interesting. That's not, there's nothing in the metadata I can go ahead and tell you. So. Okay, so for this one, uh, we'd be searching inside files. And so we would use binlock and we would try to extract hidden files in. Okay. Okay. Uh, I know it's kind of crowded, but uh, after doing this, uh, you can see that something is extracted here. So we're going to CD into that. Okay. 
Okay, and so when we uh, CD into that, we can see that there is a file and then another directory. So let's go ahead and CD into base images and see what's in there. Okay, so you can see that there's a JPEG, so we're going to extract from that. And kind of just keep going. Yeah, there's the last one. <laughs> okay, and finally, you can see after going through all the dolls and all the doll images, uh, we finally get the flag. There just been a cat. Okay, and that would be the flag right there. So. Yeah, that's the next one. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this next one, Glory of the Garden, will be the next one we're doing. Um, so this is one of the cool ones where you could either, if you have a hex editor, you can open it up in a hex editor, or you can open it up in Notepad. Um, so that's just a trick to remember to open up in Notepad. But let's start with opening up in the hex editor. Okay, so when you first open it up, you'll see uh, GFIF, which is the header for uh, J, uh, .jpg extension. So you can either scroll to the end and see if there's something there, or you can control find when you find, uh, it's kind of good practice, just put on all so it searches everything in case you're in the middle of the file. And we're just gonna search and yeah. So there would be the flag. And then the same thing if you open up in uh, Notepad. And also you might not find the flag in when you open up as a notepad, but sometimes when I've completed CTS, I found hints in. So even the flag's not in there, you can kind of do like a cursory look through and it might give you a hint. And let's see if that's correct. Um, so I, I was going to do this, uh, Lashley. I'm going to quickly do this Wireshark one just to show uh, in case you're not familiar on how to look through streams. And then one more and then I'll switch with Henry. Um, so there's a lot of encrypted files here. So you might be kind of overwhelmed with where to start. Um, but an easy trick you can do is either save all the files and look through and see if there's any ASCII files that stand out that might have something in it. Or you can look, uh, you can go to the TCP, follow uh, the TCP stream, and you can actually kind of look through each stream until you see maybe something that stands out, like right there. Um, and then you would need to figure out so just curious, uh, with anyone in here, just by looking at that, can you tell me what encryption that is? Okay. 
<laughs> What's your guess? My guess is probably some sort of ROT or ROT 13 or something like Perfect, yeah, it's ROT 13. So you would just open up CyberShift, and uh, if you don't know what that means, it's rotated 13. So um, you know Pico CTF, so you could easily take like V, well, V is 13 away from I. Um, and in this, you can just maybe think the flag is, and then that. So. Okay. Okay, and the last one will be uh, mystery PNG. So. Okay, so this one uh, is a corrupt file, so I think it's one of the harder ones. No. Okay, that one. Uh, so corrupt, if you want to follow along, it's this one. So when opening this up, um, you can notice there are a few things that you want to check. So you want to check the header, which would be the first line. You would want to check the I uh, dat, which is um, everything after, after I dat is the information stored. And then you would want to check to make sure the uh, footer trailer, sometimes people call it trailer, is correct. So in order to fix that, you would probably need to search uh, unless you have it memorized, which would be really cool. Um, uh, just to make this easier. So we have that to follow along. So as you can see, a lot of things are a bit different. Uh, so just checking, so you have 89, okay, 50 is different, so you would just, okay, and then 4E, 47, 0D, 0A, and 1A, and 0A, 0, 0, 0D, 49, and 48, 44 and 52. So just notice that I did change some of these periods. So by, if you're just looking at the uh, letters over here, you might make that mistake and then wonder why it didn't work, it matches, but it actually doesn't match because you need to make sure that um, over here in the hex is the same. The other thing to look for is the I dot. Uh, so looking over here, you can see that that is a bit different as well. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and change the... So I, um... Okay, and then we're going to check the trailer. And looking at that, checking it looks the same. So we're going to go ahead and save and see what happens. Okay, and then so once uh, you save it and you fix the headers, uh, you'll get the flag. So those are the easier CTS. So steganography um, is a part of forensics. Um, does anyone have an idea what that might be? Hiding data. Yeah. Oh yeah. So basically, 
yeah, what you said is uh, basically it. It is basically when you put data in stuff that looks innocuous. And again, unlike file carving, we're actually placing it in the actual media instead of just next to it or like somewhere near it. Uh, and then you have steganography within images or sound or stuff like that. So the example I like using is this example. You have the trees. You have the, the cat image that's basically hidden un, in the tree. Um, you can, uh, I will kind of show that a little bit more later on. So images, what are images? Um, they're basically like, uh, so what is an image? Like any any idea or any like um, how how would I as a computer like store an image? If Arguments. pixels, pixels yes. Have numbers. Yes, numbers. Yeah. So what those numbers mean? Yeah. So. So you have pixels, each pixel has like a red and a green and a blue. And if you take in, if you know like light, how light works, these are the three primary colors of light. And you can use these colors to basically make any other color. Uh, and then they're usually between a value between zero and 255, which makes it an invite. And then, yeah. And then there are lots of different file formats. Um, I'll briefly ex explain those different formats. And then there are different types of compressions. I'll explain what that is. And then it's like that. So you have three different colors, um, like uh, red, green, and blue. And then you combine those. They make complete all the colors of that we can uh, know of. And you can see here that I did like an example. So like you have green, red, and then blue. If you combine them, you make this, uh, this uh, kind of beige -ish kind of color. Uh, so different types of formats. So I mentioned uh, compressions, different formats. So BMP or bitmap is the most basic format. There's no compression and it just has, literally lists out the red, green, and blue colors in like a, like a flat like file. And it just puts it like uh, from top of, the, top of the, the first row, first column, all the way down to the, bo the bottom of the image. Uh, I think let's have a little quick video. So here is a guy that actually create a bitmap image in tech, in like notepad. So. So let's, so we have this image. And then here, let me uh, see if I could speed up. So, so here you can see that he's actually, um, oh, okay. so here he uh, does some colors. And you can see that basically he's basically just doing random colors and just typing it uh, or like uh, right drawing it in there. But you will see soon it actually something interesting. So just skip. So he does this for a while. Uh, skip, skip, skip. So like you can see that th this looks like random colors to you, right? But at the very end, oh, right here. So. He does this, and then you open a notepad. <laughs> and this works because a, BM, a bitmap is literally just the pixels, the, the red, green, and blue colors. And then the numbers that you give it are ex exactly the bytes that you see there. So that's a little kind of cool thing. And then PNGs, um, 
they are a slightly different. They actually have this idea of compression because think about if you have an image, you have a lot of pixels, but then you're basically, if your image is really big, then your file is very big. And obviously we want to make it smaller because you're going to have to transfer that download that is kind of a bother. And like, yeah, a pixel, you, you want to have, um, you want to have more data and less uh, with, and like try to compress it as much. So here we have PNG is a lossless compression, which means that all the pixel data is still there, it's just compressed. And so that way you have a smaller image size. What does lossless mean? It just basically means that um, you don't lose any data. And that's basically uh, what it is. And then you have a JPEG, uh, which is a lossy compression of image. So this, on what it means is you basically lose some information about the data, but then it compresses even better than uh, PNGs usually. So ever wonder why when you go into, like, try to save an image, let's say in Paint, and then you save it as a JPG file, it starts to look kind of fuzzy. Has anyone ever had that, uh, ever done that before? Just go into PNG, you have like a white background or something like that, and then maybe have some drawing in there, and then when you save it, it looks fuzzy. Well, this is the compression at work. So what it does is it actually changes some of the pixels to make it compress better. So yeah, it changes it. And normally when you're looking at like actual pictures, so let's say if I take a picture with my camera, the background's already very noisy and just a little bit pixel value change won't make a difference. Yeah, so yeah, that's the idea. It's mainly used for photographs. If you take a picture, you don't really care about the exact small, the small, the exact representation of an image. So images as data, um, as I mentioned before, images is just a string comprises of like a red, green, and blue, and it's just a bunch of string of numbers. The question is, can we hide any information there? Of course we can. That's a, but do we need all eight, five, eight bits, eight bits of the color information to, to be able to distinguish the image? Well, or like the other question is, do we actually even notice like the low bits? Do we need those? So like, obviously our eyes, we can't really see very, like we can't really differentiate some pixel values like from like a value of 255 versus 254. And so we actually can hide a lot of information in the low bits because just one one pick one byte one like intensity difference doesn't make a huge difference in how we perceive the image especially if it's like a very mess like a very uh, noisy image so some tools uh, the first one i i like using is this this one uh, this is like a standard stack most standard tool that you can use to uh, solve a lot of these stego photo steganography stuff. Um, yeah. And then, so here is an example of, this is like some image, and then you can see if I try to view it in certain, with certain options, I can see like a uh, different uh, uh, text. So before I go into that, actually, I'll go into move it into more advanced stuff. So if you, when you start playing with images, one of the thing, tools that you'll like, you'll come across is called something called PIL, PIL or PILLOW, short for PILLOW. It is a library for processing images, Python library. And then, so here I will use code examples and I, you, we, and I, we will upload the slide so you can uh, view it as reference. So here, uh, if you want to install Pillow, there's like a command. Um, just install the Pillow library. It should be very straightforward. So let's say I wanted to, this first example here, I open an image. So you can see here, 
you just call image open, and then you have the width and the height of an image. So I also have the the actual examples of it. So let's do this. So here I have the same I have the same thing. So here I use this image. Uh, uh, let's just uh, make sure. So here is the image. Ooh, I opened up with GIMP. So here is that image that uh, I doubt I that uh, that we know and love. Uh, and then you can see this is an image of a tree, but later we will see that this is actually not the case. So you can also, if you want to play along with this, you can go and open up Wikipedia. And then if you look up the page on steganography, it will actually, the image is actually still right here. So I can actually just copy the image address and just download it. And then that should be uh, the same one. Yeah, it should be the same one. But uh, that's if you want to play with that. So the first one, uh, we can, if I run the program, it just tells me, oh, the picture is 200 pixels by 200 pixels. Very uh, straightforward. So now, when we look at the second example, we have this, we're now, um, we have this, uh, now we're doing some stuff. We're getting a pixel. So we can see that we're reading the coordinates, the x, y, the, the first pixel on the top. And it's x, y, and then it will print out that. So if I run that, it will actually uh, just tell me that the pixel, the first one, one is this value right here. I can actually, uh, let me open up in GIMP. And then we can actually test that. So this one. So this is talking about this pixel right here. And then if we look in GIMP, it tells me it is, well, it has this value. And I will just, uh, this one. It won't tell me the uh, friggin' the uh, RBG value. So here, basically, they gave me, GIMP gave me a uh, red, green, and blue as like one number, but you can actually see these are the same numbers. Um, 157, 177, 157, 177, 1212, right? 214 right here. So those are the same values, just different notation. So now, I want to, so let's look at this third example that I had here. Oh, here I will actually be creating a new image. So here I actually will be creating using new instead of loading in an image. And here I'm just um, putting it into a writing, putting a pixel there and then writing it to a new file. So if I run this one, it will create a new file called green.png. And then if I open it up, it's just a green background. It's nothing very interesting, but we can actually do something more interesting with that. So let's say I want to make the color different for, uh, let's uncomment this to do some co different coloration. So I don't know what that does. So if I run this, then let me uh, reload. You can see, oh, it's a very beautiful uh, gradient. So I can actually do some more interesting stuff. Maybe I can uh, make it a random, maybe I can randomize this, uh, uh, the blue component and then uh, run it again. Oh. Uh, and then uh, let's 
open it up again. You now see that the blue, you can see how the blue is kind of different in areas. Like you can see the pixelated thing because the blue is just randomly assorted. So you can see how there's some interesting things that can happen. So now what I want to do is actually solve the Stego problem in, a, in Python. And you can actually, and here I have some code that actually does that. So if I run this, what it's actually doing is it's running it. So it is actually opening the image, the trees.png file, and then writing it to this cat.png file. So if I open up in GIMP, I can see, oh, there's the cat. And again, let me uh, remove cat PNG, and then uh, you can see that it is gone. Let me run this again. So you can see this is the original image. And then if I open up cat, it's there. So you can see, you can't really tell from this image that there's some hidden image inside. But obviously, the, the truth is strange. The truth is sometimes stranger. So yeah. And the code is actually what, if you see, look at the code is actually not very complex. All it's doing is it's taking the pixel data right here and then it's amplifying the lower two bits. So you can see here, I'm actually just doing a right, left shift six, and I'm just amplifying those bottom two bits and then putting it back and writing it to a new image. And that's all I'm doing. And, you, and like, this is some of the interesting stuff we can do with Stego. And I haven't even gotten to like sound because that's completely different. Sound is also something you can store as like binary data as like numbers, but then its rules for stuff is very is also complicated in itself in its own right. So, yeah. Uh, other these are some other resources that uh, I put. Trail of bits, and then this one CTF one hundred one has a bunch of information. And yeah, that is the end of our the presentation.